This is your life. This is London's Bond Street and just along here, a world famous music company where the man I'm after is launching a new record and I expect will be at the piano playing his own signature tune. Now for some 50 years he's entertained music lovers of all kinds, concert hall, music hall and for 18 years his own radio program has been drawing huge audiences. Now, I'll just give you one clue. Most people, indeed all people, I think, know his surname, but very few know his Christian name. Really, they obviously enjoyed your playing, as I hope you will enjoy the surprises I have in this book. Because Alberto Semprini, maestro of the piano, tonight this is your life. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, ladies. Will you come with me for all those surprises? I suppose I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as I said earlier, there you're known to the world as Semprini, but in fact you have three Christian names, haven't you? Certainly. They are? Why don't you say it? You tell me. Fernando Ricardo Alberto. And now I'll say it. Fernando Ricardo Alberto Semprini, this is your life. And it's an unusual name for a son of Somerset. For that's where you were born, in Bath, on March the 27th, 1908. Your father was an Italian musician who married an English opera singer. And your Italian connections are still very strong, because two of your sons, by your late first wife, live in Milan. But they've flown from there to be with you tonight, oh. Kiko and Lello. <laughs> And we've more to add to that international family of yours, the Spanish girl you married 29 oh. years ago, your wife, Cello. <laughs> your sons, Chris and Chevy. <laughs> and your daughter-in-law, Chevy's wife, Chinese-born Haley. <laughs> Cello, he just said to me on the way here that A, you told him to clean his shoes today, which he'll never forget, and B, he said, 29 years, he said, and not one day of unhappiness. Marvellous. True. Now, with such an international family, Cello, Alberto must be quite a linguist. He is really, apart from English and Italian that he speaks very well, he had to learn to speak Spanish to propose to me. <laughs> and also, uh, the biggest surprise for me, too, was that at my son's wedding with Haley, he got up and did a beautiful speech in Cantonese, pure Cantonese. And Haley, were you surprised as anyone? Oh, yes. I mean, he got up, he apologized to the non-speaking, you know, the Chinese, the guests, and um, he said, well, I'm sorry, but what are you about to hear? You know, you won't be able to understand. And he came up with this Cantonese, and we were so surprised. And I had an aunt who, who couldn't stop jumping up and down. She was screaming and, you know, with delight. And, oh, it was, oh, it was lovely. <laughs> and, Chevy, how had your father learned Cantonese so quickly? Well, we found out later 
that he'd been given secret Cantonese lessons by Haley's sister. But English, in fact, of course, was your no. first language, and you learnt it when you were born here in Lymore Gardens, Oldfield Park in Bath. Oh, and yeah. right now, I'd like to take you back 67 years to when this picture was taken. Now, we just found it. Do you recognize yourself there in the foreground? Oh, You're the one with the toy train, aged just two and a half. But also, on your right in that picture, holding a doll, is a young girl who today still lives in the avenue where the picture was taken nearly 67 years ago. Now in her 70s, she's not able to travel to London, but from her home in Limer Avenue, Bath, she recalls those childhood days. Olive Dutton. Hello, Albert. You won't remember this, but when I used to take you out when you were a little toddler, you used to bring your wooden train on a piece of string behind us. But now you've given many hours of happiness to th thousands of people with your beautiful piano playing. I hope it'll continue for some time yet. It's been nice speaking to you. Goodbye, have a very happy evening. Thank you, Olive Dutton. <laughs> Now, Bath was in its heyday as a fashionable spa, and your father played French horn in the popular Pump Room Orchestra. You go to the St. John the Evangelist School, then to the famous Bath Forum School, and there at first you convey something of a false impression. Because Albert appeared to have such a big head, although really he was very modest. From those school days 58 years ago, your pal Victor Smith. I knew it. Victor, why did he appear to have such a big head? Well, as a matter of fact, when he was a boy, he had a shock of curly hair. And uh, he had to wear a school cap, naturally. But there was one of these little tiny peak caps, you know, and it wouldn't stay on his head. So he went capless, oh, no. did he? No, 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 no. He was very inventive. He, uh, he got hold of a, a, a rather big flat cap. He pulled off the stud. He put the badge on the top of that. And then he put that on, and he covered his hair all right. But, of course, that doesn't mean to say he was in any way big-headed, because he was quite modest. As a matter of fact... Round about that time, I was a boy soprano, and we were organising a, a Christmas concert. And I asked Albert if he would play the piano and accompany me, but he said, oh, no, he said, I'm, I'm not good enough. Well, a few months later, he was off to Italy, where he studied at the uh, Conservatorio in Milan, uh, at, at Verdi in, in Milan, and, and at the age of 18, he graduated with the highest possible piano-playing degree. And on top of that, I've often thought that if he had only consented to play at that particular concert, I might have claimed through my life that I was the first person to sing with Sam <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Victor Smith. Thank you. <laughs> In fact, by 1919, your family had returned to Milan because your father had been appointed assistant to Toscanini, the legendary conductor at La Scala Opera House. And even as a teenage student, you actually played with the renowned La Scala Orchestra under Toscanini. And prompted, I gather, a remark from uh, the late great maestro. What did he say when he saw you? He said, if they carry on like this, this won't be a theatre anymore. It will be a kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> but as a boy in Italy, music isn't your only interest. There you are with your brother oh, Tino, about yeah. the time you start to dabble in chemical experiments at home. But his efforts can only be described as a stinking failure. <laughs> From his home in Monte Carlo, your younger brother, Tino Semprini. <laughs> so, Tino, you didn't appreciate his interest in chemistry. The family also didn't appreciate that. <laughs> well, you know, he was a special. He used to have a room where he made some experience of chemicals. And once he wanted to make some acid, uh, nitric acid, nitric, nitric acid. acid. Well, I don't know what happened. There was a red gas that came up. We had to all go out of the house, and we was, for three hours we were on the store waiting, and it was winter. So I never forget that again. You? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tino Zabrini. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Well, it's just as well you didn't try too many of those experiments because there were lots of visitors to your home in Milan. And being a musical family, most were musicians or singers. And one day in 1924, when you were 16, your parents introduced you to a young singer whom they've invited to stay at the family home. That was when you first meet a young girl from Oldham in Lancashire whose voice was later to thrill audiences throughout the world with singing like this. Yes, that girl singing with the Fame La Scala Orchestra became one of the world's most renowned opera singers and she especially interrupted a holiday in Switzerland so she could be with you tonight. Dame Eva Turner. No. <laughs> Dame Eva, you'd been invited to Milan to sing with the La Scala Company. Yeah, quite right, Eamon. And that is how I met Alberto's father, who very, very kindly invited me to come and stay with the family. Alberto was just a teenager, but oh, how he was dedicated to the piano. He practiced, practiced. Practiced, practiced, I can't tell you. Oh, it was, he was really so dedicated, but it really caused me quite a problem. Why was that? Well, you see, he uh, really stayed there at the family piano, and I never could get there, Alberto, <laughs> because, uh, and I had to uh, practice for my performances at the Scala. My accompanist, nor myself, could never get to the piano. There was Alberto playing away, uh, but uh, may I tell you, it has been more than justified because he's uh, now a pianist who commands my highest admiration. Uh, Ammirazione tale. <laughs> Thank you, Davido Tano. What a Well, by the time you're 22, you've completed your studies with a doctorate in conducting and composition. In Italy, as elsewhere in the world, the recording industry is in its infancy, in the 20s, and you're invited to make a record. The result is that you become one of Italy's first recording stars, a heartthrob with an avalanche of fan mail. Next, you form a popular piano-playing duo with the late Bormioli and become famous throughout Europe. You become great friends with another famous piano-playing duo, the renowned Ravitz and Landar. Marion Rabbitson happily died seven years ago, but to greet you again after ten years, his partner, Walter Landar. But Walter, I know that as well as becoming a good friend of Alberto, I know you have a great respect for him professionally. Oh, indeed, Eamon. One of the finest pianists and one of the greatest musicians, and I mean this with all my heart. Yes. But not only that, he's so versatile, for instance, as a young man, he went to America to collect jazz rhythms, the newest in jazz rhythms, went back to Italy to form the Rhythmo Symphonic Orchestra, with which he conducted on Italian radio and toured. But that's not all, because he spent quite some time as conductor for the second company at La Scala. What more can you do in music? Thank you, Walter Landau. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you make a number of trips to America in the 30s as a piano playing star on the luxury transatlantic liners. You, you got back to Italy and by the end of the 30s you'd become one of the most famous musicians there, but you still feel very English, even dressing in plus fours, I believe. That's right. But when Mussolini and his fascists come to power, the American-inspired music you're playing strikes a sour note. They demand you play Italian nationalistic music or the classical music of their German allies. At great risk, you refuse. Now, you had dual nationality, and they seized both your Italian and British passports. You were trapped in Italy for the duration of the war, and in that unhappy period, you refused to play in public. 
Immediately the Allies advanced through Italy, you hitchhiked to Rome to offer your services to Enza to entertain British troops. You carry your piano around on a battered truck and there you are playing for wounded troops in a Rome hospital. The war over, you pick up your career and take an engagement in Spain. And Cello, that's where you met. Certainly. I saw this dark hair. I, I was in the company as a chorus girl, <laughs> actually, uh, as a chorus girl, and I saw this, this dark hair sort of Valentino appear, and I fell in love straight away with him. I hope he did the same. <laughs> Well, obviously, yes. Two years later, in 1948, you were married and returned to set up home in England. Still rebuilding your career, you work in cabaret, and in 1949, your first radio program. The variety halls were enjoying a boom, and you join other radio personalities on nationwide tours, feet tucked under that famous white piano. And when they weren't tucked under the piano, they were tucked under the dining table. He toured with you frequently in those days and became great friends with yourself and Cello. He's just dashed over from the Adelphi Theatre, comedy acting star, John Pertwee. <laughs> so, John, his, uh, his appetite wasn't just for music. No, he's, no he, he's the most tremendous eater I've ever known in my life. Um, he has a wife who's a supreme cook. Uh, she took compassion on my cousin Bill and I when we were together. We were all touring in caravans, and uh, Consuelo said, oh, come on, you come and eat with us. So he had a full breakfast, uh, the, the lot, you see, and then he had coffee in the morning and biscuits, and then he had a little light luncheon, about five courses. <laughs> then, we, then he practised a little in the back of his van. With, we had the, at the back of his truck, he had his piano, and he did some practising, and then he had a cup of tea and a few biscuits just to keep him going. And... Um, then we went off to the theatre, and then in between the shows, he always had three Kit Kats. He said, <laughs> this was to keep him going, you see, until the proper meal of the day, which was dinner. And we went back, and we used to eat then a five-course meal for dinner at night. Superb cooking. I've never tasted better. <laughs> sempre means always in Italian, and there'll always be a semprini. God bless you, me also. <laughs> Thank you, John Perfley. And there's someone else, Albert, who will never forget those touring days, a young comedian who was to become an award-winning actress and who recalls to this day what you taught her. Oh, Albert, what about having the veal cooked in the white wine with the capers? <laughs> well, of course, one of your closest family friends, comedy star Beryl Reed. <laughs> Well, Beryl, it sounds as though Albert was running cookery classes. Well, almost, but it, Albert and uh, Consuelo made me very happy in those days. We had some wonderful times and very carefree times looking back at it. I mean, there was Albert with his music library and his piano on rubber in this Bedford lorry and uh, the cows have never done better. I mean, they were <laughs> responding to the music, weren't they, as you played in the fields. <laughs> but it's beautiful to enjoy this evening with you, Albert. Thank you. And Thank lovely, you lovely to see you. Thank, Thank, Thank you, you, Beryl Reed. <laughs> In 1959, millions of radio listeners hear this announcement for the very first time. Hello. Old ones, new ones, loved ones, neglected ones. Semprini Serenade, a program that's still going strong to this very day. And so is your popularity in the concert hall, where you strike up a close friendship with a fellow performer. And you'll know who I mean when you hear this. But, but, glorious but. Nothing quite like it for cooling the blood. Yes, your great friend, famous bass baritone yeah. and broadcaster, Ian Wallace. Yeah. Ian, I know you have great respect for Alberto in the world of serious music. Very much I've got a respect, as everybody has a respect. And I think the wonderful thing about your career, Alberto, is that... Uh, you could have gone on and just been the classical pianist and the jet set all over the place to this much more restricted audience. As it is, you've given your wonderful talent to millions and millions of people. But his memory at times lets him down, you know. We were doing a concert together. I mean, he plays everything from memory, of course. But we were doing a concert and he did the first 25 minutes and then he stepped forward and he said, 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure to introduce a very old friend of mine, a singer, you all know him, a very old friend of mine, he's a bass baritone. I thought, he's forgotten my name. <laughs> and sure enough, he had, and so I, I came and he, he looked so relieved, really so relieved indeed. But, you know, there's nobody plays the hippopotamus song like Alberto... Alberto... <laughs> Tchaikovsky. <laughs> Thank you, Ian Wallace. <laughs> But away from the world of music for many years now, you've given much of your time and energy to the St. John Ambulance Brigade, becoming Vice President of the Rygate area where you used to live, and in 1972 being made an Officer of the Order of St. John. You were nominated for that award by a doctor who works voluntarily for the St. John Ambulance Brigade and has another reason to be grateful for your concern for those in ill health. He, in fact, speaks to you now from Black Notley Hospital in Essex, where he is a consultant, your good friend, Dr. Nichols Palmer. Hello, Albert. Here at Notley, we are making full use of the pool, both for the treatment of patients and for the staff recreation. When, just over ten years ago, I mentioned to you the need for this pool, you immediately offered your services to give some charity concerts. It wasn't long before we were able to invite you to come and open the pool. Do you remember that day? You were dressed in your best tails. <laughs> this is how you ended up. <laughs> Albert, you made quite a splash. To bring you his thanks in person, he's here, Dr. Nichols Power. Oh. <laughs> Alberto, before we finish, I'd like to take you back more than 30 years to the end of the war when you were entertaining British servicemen in Rome. A uh, singer was due to follow your act. This was the singer. This was her song. Sammy, Sammy, don't ever wander away from the alley and me. Sally, Sammy, marry me, Sally, and happy forever. Yes, the Opera House. Uh, the Opera House Rome. in Rome. Oh, yeah. And you were very marvellous and volunteered to accompany me. And we had a little rehearsal in some little room. I didn't really know you then. I didn't know who it was. I thought it was another Enzo pianist, because I had one everywhere I moved. You know. <laughs> and when you started to play, I thought to myself, this fella can play better than I can sing. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> and we had a wonderful time. And then you did your act before me. You were playing beautiful, doing marvellous. The audience applauded and it was wonderful. And then you went off after taking your curtains and it all went quiet and I thought, well, it must be me now. I've got to go on. So as you came back again, I walked on to you. You looked at me consternated. I said it right. You thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought, well, I don't know. So I started, Sally, and he picked it up and played it. I bust in, I busted your encore. You came on to do an encore, and I... <laughs> <laughs> and I always said to myself, oh, if I could only get somebody like Semprina to come with me, I'd go back to the stage. <laughs> so you had a job. <laughs> Thank you, Gracie Field. Thank you. surrounded by your friends and by most important of all to you your family your very international family but I haven't mentioned a small town north of the Arctic Circle there you have another son who because of the remote area in which he lives because of his own business commitments and your own concert tours you haven't been able to meet up with for 18 years but you've exchanged letters in which he's told you about his marriage and sent you photographs of his wife and your two grandchildren none of whom you've ever seen 
that from Bodo on the northern tip of Norway, we've flown your son here tonight. After 18 years, here he is, Giorgio. And now, at long last, you can meet for the first time your Norwegian daughter-in-law, Anne Magritte. And your grandchildren, Tatina and Elizabeth. Alberto Semprini, this is your family, this is your life.